I'm Emma Louise Coffey and you're welcome to the Dairy Edge, the Chagas Dairy Podcast. We're bringing you the latest information, insights and opinion to improve dairy farm performance. On this week's show, part two of my interview with Ed Payne, where we discuss labour management, the necessity for learning and progression for all members of the dairy team. But first, I asked him about the introduction of a second dairy unit and once a day milking. So again, if you were to roll back to when we decided, I, um, I suppose one of the biggest risks I would have seen then to our business would have been labour, would have been the availability of good um, full-time staff um, to just come and get the job done. So that was where we leaned more towards once a day, that we will be able to integrate it more into the system and not leave ourselves at as high a risk to, to labour changes or whatever it was going forward. So that was probably one of the main ones. Um, not to add a huge amount more stress to the system. Okay, so we've spoken about the fact that we run this farm at four cows a hectare. It's quite a high management level. Um, and that's probably the backbone of the business. 300 cows, 320 cows running here um, at four cows a hectare. It, it takes a good bit of time. It takes a good bit of management. So we wanted any addition regarding a second farm to not to not increase the stress level to a point where everyone was going to start barking down each other's throats and it was going to start to unravel. So we wanted to utilize the grass that was growing on that farm, sell as many kilos as we could, as stress-free, as labor um, efficiently as possible. So what's happened now is we've taken on a second full-time man who can do the work in Ballymo, do the milking there, but also double over, help with a good bit of relief in the second farm, in the in this twice a day farm, and give a good bit more time off or whatever it is for our Aiden that was there beforehand. So um, yes, we've taken on a full-time man on Let's say if that if that was a standalone farm of 170 or 200 cows once a day, would it be able to afford them? No, but it may. Well, no, I say no. It may not be able to. But what I'm saying is, we've taken them on into the whole unit, and it's it's making it's working. Whereas if we were to try and push twice a day now out on that farm, the stress levels would increase. We'd need more relief for the weekends. We need more holiday cover. So it's just um, it's about drawing the line in the sand to say, look, at some point. It's not all about money. It's not all about the bottom line. We need everyone to have a good, you know, a good, enjoyable place to work here, and everyone to be able to get on. And the end goal to be to be always achievable. And the end goal is not, you know, not to stop at this unit. Is to go on and go on. But if we were to if we were to push this unit, you know, that stress may <laughs> make scamper further plans. So we're milking in two herds now since the beginning of this year. We're milking 300 cows twice a day, and we're milking 170 cows once a day. Um, that hunt, that once a day herd is the new herd that was established on a it's on an owner's block as well. Um, what the farm I was born and reared on actually, and what we call the home farm. Uh, so there's 170 milk cows and getting milked once a day there. So there's 170 there and 300 here. And talk through the decision to convert the home farm to dairy. So I suppose when we started dairying on the first farm, we still had a lot of sucklers and a lot of other stock around us, sheep and whatever else, and um, we had quite a good stock an overall stocking rate but what slowly started to happen over a three or four year period was we were cramming more and more mature cows milking cows obviously where the milking parlor was and our support blocks and that owned farm was getting uh, less and less utilized and there was um one time one year about this time of the year where the farm at home there was just growing grass over the hedges looked terrible and which would not have been the case for that farm before and it would have you know in years gone by it would have been the more productive farm and it drove myself and my father mad to see this farm getting underused. So that was sort of the start of where we started to chat. Look, maybe we could start to sell some milk off this farm at some stage. Now that conversation twisted and turned through lots of different variations. Um, it went from uh, one part, there's a road splitting that farm. So there was a part of one side of the road, maybe a robot, maybe a robot both sides. And then eventually we put a conventional parlor in the middle of the farm and we're making once a day. Um, now that took a good few years. Um, uh, to get to that decision, but that was sort of the the, the quick steps. <laughs> Let's say put put you through it quickly, but that was the process. So you're talking 470 cows are being mm. milked currently. What is the labour requirement across the two farms to you know ach- achieve this every day? Yep. So I suppose the day to day people that are that are working outside. I suppose myself, my father is still full time, very involved. We have one full time um, man in Tulsk on the twice day unit, Aiden, and we've just employed a second full time person, Richard. Uh, he's based mainly in the once a day farm up in Ballymo. Um, so there's four, there's four of us now. There's an extended team. Obviously, I'm married to Jennifer and my mother uh, involved in the background, and and you know 
um, they do all those all those unforeseen tasks that you you know you don't think about um, working away in the background. But the day to day running is four full time people. And talk through you know you mentioned you're working on the farm. Uh, what does your day look like? Yeah, uh, so yeah, it's a good question, then, Louise. Yeah, um, so again, that my role um, has maybe altered a little bit over the last three or four years, especially now since we've taken on the second farm into what some might categorise as a more management role or a more overseeing role. Um, I call it, I was only thinking about this a couple of days ago, I call it more like, I suppose I'm sort of maybe the glue around the place, if you want to put it that way. I just, I make sure that things are running, that everyone has what they need to get stuff done. Um, but like, not not forsaken, I'm, I'm still doing a full day's work. I was out this morning driving tractor with a dump trailer, whatever it is. But um, it's just to make sure that the, that the cogs are running smoothly, I suppose, is what I try to keep an eye on. Um, so whether that's overseeing or management, I don't know what way you want to put it. Um, like, it's interesting. We have a seriously good team. Fortunately, I don't do much milking anymore myself. Um, but it's not that I'm not busy, let's put it that way. Ed, you mentioned the team and, you yeah. know, your your family labour, employed labour, students and contractors. You know, there's there's a lot of people involved. How important is a good team on a on such a large scale farm? It's it's pretty much it's everything Emily Louise to us here. Like we often say it if anyone comes around the place, it's like if we didn't have the people working here, what we've done over the last few years, like it just wouldn't be possible. So um, I often think of like, you know, you literally, you can't fight without soldiers. And like, I have a huge amount of respect for everyone that helps out the place here. And like our team, and including that, we have a very good Chagas advisor. Um, you know, we have good connections with the co-ops with who we trade with and who we buy from and things like that. So like, it's just a matter of, of building those relationships, keeping them strong and having respect for the people that you work with and, and that. So like, and I, I consider that quite an important phrase myself too. Just, just, um, I don't consider the people here, although obviously we pay their wages and they, they technically work for us. I'd like to feel that they feel like they work with us, that it's very much a team basis. I don't ask anyone to do anything I'm not willing to do myself, et cetera, et cetera. Do you know, um, like we've built up a good, strong team and it allows us to, it, it gives us a foundation to continue to build upon. There's no, like, there's no doubt that I couldn't obviously make the two, the two herds, the three milkings we have every day and, and get to keep going. Like, you know, so it's, it's, it's on the back of their strength that we, you know, and we need to show our respect to them. Yeah. And you mentioned Aidan and Richard are with you full time. Yeah. But you yeah. also also mentioned the, the other labour on the farm would, would add up to approximately 10 people. That, that yeah. sounds so excessive. In, so can you explain where these people are coming into the system? Yeah. So including ourselves uh, this spring, uh, we had 11 people on the roster uh, for maybe a two or three month period. So that's myself, my father, my wife, um, Aidan, Richard. Then we had uh, a relief milker for the weekends. We had a full time night watch person, um, a calf rarer. Um, let me think. Uh, I'm nearly through them all. So, you know, just things like probably, oh yeah, we had a German student that was staying that was helping Aiden here on the Tricity unit. So I, I, grew, I was building up in Ballymore still and stuff. So we had a German student. Um, like the springtime, uh, I think I think farmers maybe, you know, they get into it before they realise just how busy they are. Like we have, no, we, we don't make any excuses over having a lot of help around. I, say, I, I turn down no one pretty much that wants to come and work at any time of the year. I will give them a bit of work here and there, even on quiet times, knowing that hopefully they'll be there to answer a phone call come March if I'm a bit stuck. Like we, we do like to have a lot of help at hand during the busy periods because um, there's absolutely no point in everybody getting burnt out. I've done that for a couple of years. Um, I've done the 22 hour days and a couple hours sleep and go again. And um to think that that's a, a strong business plan to build upon and to go forward to have the sort of and this isn't my saying but to have this badge of honor regarding you know we have to work those sort of hours it's it's not on like you it won't work going forward not here anyway not for us that's not that's not the way we're going to run it and in terms of you know having the help in place um yeah. you know it lends its, itself to a bit of work life balance um, yeah. And, you yeah. know, you make no apologies for talking about that and, you know, t- taking time off from the farm. What sort of things do you do to fill your time? 
<laughs> um, yeah, so I suppose the last couple of years I've been I've been tied up with. I was fortunate enough for that to be awarded an Uffield scholarship back in 2017. So that took up a lot of travelling time last year and a lot of time this year with one thing and another. So that was you know that was a big commitment outside of farming, and it's thanks again to everyone that was on the farm that allowed me to to you know to be able to do that. But like I like to stay fit before that, you know, I'm a keen cyclist. I've ran a couple of marathons, whatever it is, you know, just whatever it is. And I have two young kids, one six and one two. Um, you know, they'll be flown the nest before we know it. So I need to try and dictate a bit of time to them, um, as well as trying to build a business for them in the future. So you have to, you know, you have to watch all sides. But um, of course it's it's a vital part, especially if you have young kids or you have something else that you like to do off farm. It's you know. Um, and I suppose just to, to pick up on a few of those things, uh, firstly, the yep. Nuffield, um, I suppose, can you give us like a brief, maybe a 30 second, what, what, are you, what is that? Some people might yep. have heard of it before. OK, yeah, yeah. So Nuffield Scholarships, uh, a, a worldwide scholarship that's awarded uh, every year. So there's about sort of 80 scholarships awarded over eight or nine countries every year. Ireland awards five or maybe six uh, scholarships, which gives people the opportunity to. Um, to travel globally, get a, a, a sort of a view of world agriculture. Uh, so you travel for six weeks or six and a half weeks with a group of nine other scholars. Uh, before that, you'll have met in some country around the world. It was Brazil the year I did mine, where all scholars that year, there was 86 in my year. We met in Brazil for 10 days. Um, and then I traveled after that with those nine other scholars. And then you do a portion of individual travel, um, which I traveled to Canada and America. You, you study over your two year period and you write a report at the end, to present that to the industry. Um, my chosen topic is farmers' responsibility to become more um, sustainable employers in the future. And some key learnings from, from your study, Ed. Yeah. Um, so I suppose there's no secret now at this stage, Louise, that there's a lot of people needed in the industry going forward. Um, we're going to need either farm managers or milkers or whatever the case may be, or just people to return home to their home farms. And um, I think farmers need to sort of wake up to the situation that at the moment, as a workplace, on average, it's, it's not somewhere that's going to... Um, be more attractive than other industries that are out there. People are getting very good educations now. They have lots of options to go and work elsewhere. And um, farming needs to sort of come to the table a little bit more about becoming a better workplace, about creating a creating a job that people will say, yeah, that's actually something I'd like to do for, for a period of time as a career, not just as a, a summer job or a springtime job that they can, that we can build build careers around people or build careers for people so that we can open doors, if that makes sense. So it, it's, you know, like, as an industry ourselves, I just, that's that's sort of where I'm trying to look into. Um, some of the key findings, I suppose, is just that people need to know, um, we'll run through it quickly, but they need to know a lot more about themselves, their management skills, their management type. They want to be aware of what sort of culture they're creating on the farm so that they can get someone to fit into that much better. Um, and then just about you know the legal side of things, how you manage contracts, whatever else, things like that. Um, but it's just a lot of those soft skills. A lot of it's obviously people management. And that's a new area for a lot of people in Ireland that might have been um, up until this, working on their home farm or whatever else. And now all of a sudden they need to employ a person. And it's a totally different dynamic on the farm when you're going from what used to be your system to now trying to get used to how that person milks cows or how that person does simple things like drives the tractor or does fencing. You need to, you know. Um, so it's just, you know, it's just looking at that area of how, how we're going to create a, a better workplace in the industry. With the Nuffield, there was an awful lot of travel, you know, 10 days in Brazil, you had six and a half weeks traveling across the world and your own personal, yeah. like, it's excellent to see that, you know, setting up the team around you that you're essentially not needed in the system for long periods of time. Yeah, um, it's a bit scary, really, isn't it? When you go away for six weeks, you come back and the place is even better than when you left it. But it's good. It's great, obviously. And that was a good learning curve. I, I heard you speaking at the education conference with Chagas earlier in the summer. And, you know, you, you talked about kind of continuously developing and, you know, yeah. you yourself as a farmer, but also the people working around you. Why do you think that's important? Like for myself, I suppose Nuffield was probably the biggest thing personally development I've done over the last few years. But I always love to see employees as well uh, come to me and say, whatever it is, be it a hoof train course. Richard now, he mentioned to the other day he wants to do the AI in course and, and we'll get that done, obviously. And that's, you know, it's great to see them wanting to come and wanting to progress because that only strengthens the business. Um, so like it's, I suppose it, it's a good sign for me if I can see the employees coming or the lads coming to talk to me and say, look, I, you know what? 
I want to learn the skill. It's a weakness that I have. And, you know, we're looking to strengthen that. Um, obviously myself, you know, business courses or whatever it is that I need to do. Like while I was traveling with Nuffield, I was over in America, met a farmer there. And I suppose key taken from him was he said, you know, it's very easy to know what you know, but you, you need to know what you don't know as well and, and to try and strengthen those areas. And that, that's what it's about. People having the awareness to say, yeah, I'm, I'm weak in this area. I need to either get a contractor in to do X, Y, and Z, or I need to, you know, find, can I get a course or can I go and read up or do something on that? And, um, and it may, it may be able to do it within the team. Like, you know, there's no, there's no reason like Richard now we're going to train him up that he can do the grassland management or whatever on that once a day farm. And that's, that can all be done in house, so to speak. Um, and it, but, but allowing that to happen, like, so, you know, many people could just think, Oh no, he just doesn't do that job and we'll do it for him or we'll just throw him at it and let him, you know, let him try and find his own way, which isn't great either. So like, just to help these people along, try and get a bit of a ladder for them. And in terms of, I'd say, the continuous learning, you know, mm. you were mentioning, say, you know, becoming good at business. You know, is, is there anything else you're targeting um, as areas that you need to improve on as a farm owner? At the moment, let's say, if I was, to, if you were to ask me my weakness going forward, it would be that area of, of business skills. The farm is, is growing every year, more money turning over X, Y and Z. So we need to we need to focus more on that area to try and um, exaggerate that area, like outside performance. And I, I hand that over to lads now, like Aiden's Aiden's day to day running the farm here. And it's super performance. We chatted about that earlier on. I'd be very happy to where that's going. So it's and, and again, maybe. If I was to talk about some of my Nuffield topics, it's that learning about how I going forward are going to manage people, how I'm going to become more of a team like team leader to, to use the phrase or whatever it is. Like I need to be aware of how I integrate into the team, not to, you know, to make that run smoothly and to, to keep the whole thing oiled as we go along. So I suppose yeah, so I suppose to answer your question, um, business management is probably a weakness or an area I'm looking to strengthen, as well as people management. I guess they're the two key key areas. You know, farmers can be excellent with cows and excellent with grass. Business is kind of where they're getting a handle on things, you know, doing the profit monitor, assessing where you are financially as a business. And now we're taking the next step. You know, you mentioned earlier the soft skills, you know, the people skills and, and, and improving how we, you know, interact and manage people. I suppose finally to finish up, you know, the majority of herds in the country have increased herd numbers and they're in the situation where, they are looking at employing new labour or mm-hmm. they've brought some labour onto the farm. You know, from yes. your experience, maybe your top three uh, tips for farmers um, in terms of how to manage labour. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, so I see this, we've seen this a lot. Okay, so people have, like, and we were a little bit guilty ourselves, put the cows in place and then everything else will be fine. But, uh, you know, people is everything. Um, people are starting to learn that. So, yeah, top three points. Communication is key. Um, be open and... Um, talk about talk about everything get staff involved get people involved give them a little bit of involvement um, and that doesn't mean you have to open every financial account if that's not what makes you comfortable but just just communicate communication is key um, be very aware of the type of manager you are okay so there's you know your does your lead by example type of manager or does your sort of more stand back give them the tools and let them away and do a type of manager but you need to be able to recruit someone that suits your management style okay because there'll be a very soon a clash if your management style is a little bit different to what they what, what type of manager or leader that person is looking for so you need to be able to know what type of person you're looking to recruit and i suppose maybe to wind back a little bit before you start recruiting at all you need to have a really, really good idea of the actual job you're offering. Okay, so you need to know, you need to be able to write down a full job description and be able to nail that down on a piece of paper. Because when the person comes to the interview, you need to be able to say to them, your role will be X, Y, and Z. And it doesn't have to be exactly what that role turns out to be, but you need to be able to give them the respect to be able to let them know what what a vague idea or a fairly close idea of what their job is going to be. And it will give you a better impression of the person that you're looking for instead of just saying, I need someone to start working tomorrow and it's milking cows. But it turns out to be much more than milking cows. It's rearing calves. Are you able to drive tractor spread fertilizer? The weekends, the weekends on, the weekends off, what time is on and off and things like that. You know, what, what actually job you're offering. That's great. Thank you, Ed. No problem. Thank you very much. That's it for this week's episode of the Dairy Edge podcast. And my thanks to Ed Payne for joining me on this week's show. Don't forget to subscribe on Apple and Google Podcasts. And for more information, go to the Chagas website at chagas.ie. I'm Emma-Louise Coffey, and join me next time for your Dairy Edge.